Good morning. I'm Jenny Williams with Get a Real Estate Life and EXP Realty, and I'm here with my friend Gusty Goulis. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Jenny. Every Thursday morning, we come to you live at 930 because we are just scouring the country for the best talent and uh, the most interesting um, businesses to share with you. And today we have a great one. Um, we are so excited that Rob Drum has agreed to join us this morning. Good morning, Rob. Morning. Thanks for having me. No, and you've already had a closing this morning. So um, talk about when we find talent, when Gusty and I find talent, I mean, where can you get a closing already at, you know, 8.30 a.m. and uh, squeeze in uh, a chance to share some awesome uh, information with other agents. So congratulations. Thank you. I've got another one. Go to another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what a better day than Halloween to close as many as you can, right? Um, well, yeah, and a standard know, day for me. That, well, there you go. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to point out, if you'll share too, how much over asking price that house went for this morning. It went for 20000 over the list price. That is um, fantastic. Uh, and yeah. that's a happy client, right? Definitely. It's great. So let, let's talk about that for a second. All right. So you were the listing agent, right? I was. Okay. So how did you... What was your strategy to get multiple offers and to get it to that price point? So I think we, we definitely priced it right. And, you know, when I told her about what I thought the price would be, I kind of gave her a range. And, uh, and I told her, you know, at the lower end of this range, I think we'll get a pretty fast sale. And she said, yeah, that's what I want. Um, so we priced it that way. And then we ended up getting, I think, eight or nine offers within four days and uh wow. one of them yeah and one of them was significantly higher than the others um i gave all the offers you know a couple of days to revise higher if they wanted to like a highest and best situation um and this is actually the second time this year i've had one go over 20,000 above the list price because i've you know i don't just take the best offer i kind of say hey everybody we've got a couple offers um I'm giving everyone a couple of days to bring their highest and best. And usually there's a couple like right in the same range. And then maybe one that's just far and above higher and better for the seller. Sure. Well, it's not necessarily always about the highest offer. It's also about the terms of the, uh, of the offer too. Absolutely. And the other one that I had, they actually went ahead and did their inspection before the um, before the uh, highest and best time limit. So it okay. was actually way higher and inspection contingency was already eliminated. So that one was really good too. Selling agent. I mean, that, was, that, that was a great job on the buyer's yeah. agent to it be was. proactive with that. That's yeah, exactly I, I what I was saying. Selling yeah. agent, there's your tip right there. Nugget right out of the gate. Get that inspection That's done right. before you make that offer. <laughs> yeah, I learned Absolutely. that, you know, if I'm in a competitive situation and that's something we can get done, uh, it's a good way to um, to win. Well, that's fantastic, Rob. Congratulations on that. And Gusty, that's a great question. Um, if you are watching at home or at your office, then you can ask any question you want from Rob. He's an expert on this, and uh, he's happy to um, answer any question. You know, Rob, today is the last day of my 47th year. And uh, as we uh, get, no. <laughs> yes, baby, as we get closer to um, 50 in our uh, world, <laughs> um, people are wanting, you know, they ask questions about retirement. They ask questions about passive income. How are we going to take care of our children? How are we going to take care of ourselves as we get older? And uh, you kind of specialize in, in this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, really a lot of my business comes from working with investors um, and, you know, helping them to buy properties that are going to cash flow um, and that are going to be solid long term investments, kind of with a look towards um, retiring at some point. Um, and I also do a lot of that myself, uh, buying and selling for my own portfolio um, and 
building up that kind of retirement income. So I, I try to live and get as much personal experience in that area as I can and share that with clients. Um, and also, you know, working to start sharing that with agents. Well, that brings credibility, right? And uh, Gusty, I didn't mean to cut you off. You had a question? Yeah, no. Uh, what, what I think would be interesting to know is, you know, a lot of people that might be watching right now may not have any real estate investment properties or don't know even how to get started, but we might want to kind of give them a few ideas on some of the terminology that investors use. So is there some terminology that, that you could share that an invest, it's important to an investor? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess you could, you could kind of start off with, uh, you know, I kind of use some more like, I guess, slang terminology than like the official, um, the official terms for commercial real estate. Uh, a lot of investors are looking for something called the 1% rule, which is, and that's another thing that I do. I just, I honestly use a lot of just rules of thumb um, in analyzing properties. You know, when you go through and put them in spreadsheets and all that, it ends up just working out the same, pretty much the same over time. Um, so the 1% rule is if, let's say you have a property that's worth a uh, hundred thousand and it rents for 1000 per month. That would be 1% of the value is what the rent is. Thank um, you. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so usually in our market, that's going to work out to uh, after all expenses, um, including taxes, a budget for maintenance, property management, insurance, um, it's going to work out to between a hundred and two hundred dollars per month in cash flow. So that's when you know, and you have better months and you have worse months, but over the course of a year, or a couple years, you should expect uh, to see cash flow returns in that amount. And something that I really think uh, you know people can get caught up in that cash flow number because they're looking towards retirement right. um, and you obviously need cash flow uh, in retirement, but the real value and the real um, really the, the real money is made off of everything else. So I look at cash flow as what's going to sustain everything else, which is paying down the mortgage, holding that property as the market appreciates um, the tax benefits that you get that can offset even your uh, regular job income. And especially as an agent, you have uh, unlimited uh, expenses for writing off real estate losses, which can be depreciation on your rentals or any of those type of things. So it's really all those other benefits that it's almost... Uh, you know, that's, it can be overlooked, but that's where the real benefits are. Right. Well, all of them combined together is a snowball effect. And exactly. anytime that you can have someone else paying down your equity um, as you have appreciation and be able to file depreciation, all of it is a magic number. And at the end of the month, still have some money left over. And what is it that Benjamin Franklin always said? I'd rather have 100 people. Right. Giving me one percent than one person giving me a hundred percent because we can't rely always on just that one person. So um, that's the magic of it. Um, my dad had about 200 rentals when I was a kid and uh, it's a lot to manage and uh, a lot of fun. Um, uh, before we get back into, though, more of your strategy, Izzy uh, mostly has a question. Now, she and um, her significant other, her boyfriend of five years, um, Mitch, they flip properties together, but. But um, they want to start buying some rentals and she wants to know what is your biggest tip for starting out? Well, honestly, my biggest tip is, um, you know, if you can, uh, say, buy a property like a, a house hacking strategy, um, 
and we can go into what that is. Or if you can buy like your starter home and then move out and hold it as a rental, um, that's a really low risk way to get started. And it's actually the first one that I got was from doing that. It was one my wife owned and we moved out and um, we actually were selling it, but the appraisal came in low. So all of a sudden we're real estate investors and, uh, and we still own that one. And it's been a really solid rental property. I mean, that was my first one also. We paid 24000 for our very first house in Mississippi, which is hilarious. Got it at a 10.5% and thought I was doing awesome with that And <laughs> at the time. And we could not stand living there. We fought the entire time right after we got married. And uh, so after nine months, we rented that bad boy out. <laughs> yeah. We kept it for so many years. We were able to not only have um, a really good cash flow on it, um, we refinanced it a couple of times, and pulled out those tax proceeds because when you refinance and pull out the tax proceeds and still have cash flow after your refi, then you are making non-taxable income. And uh, that is the whole key of having a large inventory. So, um, uh that one was very well and then made the profit on it when we finally ended up selling it. Um, so uh, now the issue with this has been in the past couple of years is that lenders would not let you qualify for another mortgage whenever you moved out of your primary residence and turn that into a rental because they weren't using the income to offset that debt. Um, guess what, guys? It's changed. Um, I have one right now that I'm closing next month and uh, Navy Federal Credit Union is um, actually have an in-house bank loan that um, they are allowing to do this again. We're going to start doing this again and this will open up so many more investment opportunities to people um, that we have not been able to see over the past few years because of the strict mortgage rules that we've had. So sorry, I was getting a little excited there. <laughs> 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 this is important stuff. So Rob just like so nonchalantly says like a way to make millions. <laughs> but it's important. And, uh, you know, Gussie and I get to see it every single day. This is what changes people's lives. And uh, I'm far too impatient to own rentals. And that's why we've sold all of ours. <laughs> I always want to do a flip and get that money now. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so much more sense to be patient though and let it pay off over time, right? Right. Yeah, For that's sure. how my wife is too. She wants to flip everything. <laughs> and it just doesn't always work out that way. Um, no. So uh, my, I built my early career on uh, investors and uh, I have a passion for it, um, of, of course, and uh, I've helped a lot of people retire from their day jobs and uh, uh, ended up gaining a lot of free time on their hands and not knowing what to do with themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I know that you I've already sent you some business on a package of um, five houses because this is your expertise. And uh, I have gotten away from that a lot on the um, the cash flow properties. And I knew you would take better care of these people than I could. So I'm thankful to you for that. Um, you have a strategy, though, and you just recently wrote a blog about it. And uh, you have a fantastic blog, by the way. And everybody talks about it. So um, where can people find the blog? It's at robdrum.us. Okay. And, uh, you know, Gusty and I both commented on it after we read it. And, you know, tell us what um, BRRRR means, what it stands for, and why it's important. Yeah. So the BRRRR strategy is buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. And, uh, and the idea, and really what I got into in my post is that, um, the idea is that you buy a property that needs some work, fix it up, um, get it rented, and then apply for a refinance based on hopefully a higher value than what you paid for it um, and, and including the amount that you paid in repairs. And then get the refinance and then you have your initial capital back. Go, uh, go and do it again and 
build your portfolio that way. Well, and uh, this is how I've helped my clients from day one, because this is how you can pick up an asset that cash flows with nothing out of your pocket because you get the money back. And a lot of times you make money on that refinance. Now, here's the deal. Your agent better be highly skilled at knowing what the market's going to do, knowing what few repairs and how much money um, the budget is to be able to put into a property to be able to pull that out. Um, and you can get yourself in trouble if you go over that budget. Um, but this is why expertise like Rob's comes in handy because he's constantly looking at the market um, and being able to judge that. Um, I had one client alone by 14 in one subdivision in Irondale. And um, this is exactly the formula that I used to help him. And he, he got to retire early from being a cardiac nurse. And uh, his wife was a zoology teacher. And uh that these rentals pay for their retirement and the appreciation in Irondale has been phenomenal. So um, such a good move, um, such a smart move. And when I saw it the other day, I'm like, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I know that formula. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Gussie, I know you've seen a lot of um, investors through the years too, with all of your transactions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, one of the early things I did in my career just to build some uh, investors was, I created a top uh, top 10 deals list and I used to send that out every Monday and uh, I was able to generate a lot of eyeballs. I generated a lot of uh, relationships with investors. And but I also learned that everybody calls themselves a, an investor. <laughs> yes. um, every, and there's like, you know, there's investors and then there's investors. There's real ones. <laughs> and, and so, but I learned a lot through building that program up and where I was sending out an email every Monday to about 60 people. And really out of that 60, I found two really good ones. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think everybody wants to uh, invest in real estate. So um, Rob, what do you think, like as an agent, how should other agents handle working with real estate investors? What have you seen as a good strategy? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of truth to what you just said that um, it does take some, as an agent and somebody that is running a business, uh, you have to make sure you, you are using your time wisely and, um, and working with people that are going to eventually buy houses. Um, and I think, you know, so that's part of it. Uh, I think it really helps to have some experience of your own. Um, I think that makes investors feel, trust you and feel like uh, you are advising them well for the specific type of properties they're looking for and the specific uh, strategy that they're looking to execute. Um, and I think, so something else that I'd actually like both of y'all's opinion on, um, you know, having been involved as an agent longer than I have, uh, and through different market cycles is, you know, what did you see in the financial crisis as far as, um, you know, there's a lot less homeowners buying, but there's, there were more investors buying. And is that something that kind of you saw agents that were able to work with investors um, thriving more in that climate? Yeah, I'll tell you for, for myself is, um, you know, really, I, I, I built my business off of the recession. And, um, you know, I, I had some great relationships that opened the door for me that I started working with the, the, the stable uh, through the foreclosures. There was a grant that was the Neighborhood Stabilization Project. And so what that allowed was nonprofits to buy properties, renovate them and use them for their you know, purposes. And so, you know, I had a contact that put me in touch with the main buyer for our market. And in one year, I sold 21 homes to just one nonprofit. Um, so it was huge because really in 08, 09, I know in 09, we got to up to 42, 45 percent of our sales were foreclosures. And that was wow. unbelievable. 
Yeah. And so a lot of the people that, you know, I was in the office with, they had no idea what to do. So they were leaning on me because of my foreclosure experience on how to get things to the closing table. And so, um, yeah, I think you've got to be versed in all different aspects of real estate foreclosures, you know, luckily we haven't seen short sales in a long time, but you know, that will probably be something that comes around at some point, but mm -hmm. you know, foreclosures, like people, some agents are super scared of uh, showing a foreclosure foreclosures in my opinion are super easy. Um, you know, but I've also seen where just because it's a foreclosure doesn't mean it's a great deal. No. Um, you know, these, yeah. these banks want as much money for their asset as possible. So, um, but we did see a lot. Um, I mean, it was a, a heck of a market of 40%. Now it was scary in 09 for sure. Jenny? Well, wealth is made during the down times because when you do have assets that you can take advantage of during the down times, unfortunately, um, that's where you can make a huge difference in market share and in growing your portfolio um, because you're ready because you prepared for it. And uh, I'm looking forward to it um, just because I know what it means. I saw the difference that people made during this last one and uh, I'm excited about it. I almost can't wait till it gets here <laughs> 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 just because it changes everything. Expertise is a necessity at that point and um, uh, it becomes more of a necessity and uh, your expertise will rise Rob as well because um, you're going to have a lot more people that are serious that have the money that can make a difference that actually can take care of people who need it. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot of desperation that comes soon. And uh, uh, when you're ready, um, it just ends up being a beautiful thing and it can skyrocket someone's portfolio. Um, so uh, for, um, let's see, we've got two questions real quickly. Um, I had all kinds of things running through my head when Gusty was talking but let's see, what exactly do you watch to figure out what the repairs need to be? So it's really no different than if you're looking at comps for, um, you know, a home in Mountain Brook or Vestavia and you're trying to figure out what is this home worth? You really just look at other homes in the area um, that are renovated and say, okay, they sold for 90,000. They had laminate countertops. Those are old cabinets. They just painted them. Um, they did vinyl flooring. They did gray paint. They left the, um, the uh, baby blue tile in the bathroom because it was in good shape and they painted uh, just a agreeable gray. Um, so you just look at what other people did and then look at the house you're looking at and say, okay, can we do that. Um, and if we can, it should be worth about the same. Well, and uh, Izzy, what you do in that situation is your repairs are going to be for durability. Um, mm -hmm. Your upgrades are going to be for durability and not for, um, yes, you want it to look pretty, but it's not going to be like you do for a flip. Um, uh, I had uh, one man that bought so many houses from me in Mississippi and we bought the same thing. So I would make about, you know, I would make uh, 10 to, to 20 offers a week for him until we get a nibble and then we go look at it. And that's the key um, to agents. Don't spend your time looking at property. It's not about that. It's about the numbers. So um, you don't even need to go see it until um, you've got a nibble on it. That will save you hours of frustration. And, and people who are real investors, that's exactly what they want. They don't want to waste your time. They don't want their time wasted. So um, they're not going to go look at a million houses and say, well, maybe make an offer of this and do that. So that's really one of the best tips that you can take if you want to work with investors and save yourself a lot of time. And you've got to leave that because if someone, like Gusty said, um, is saying that they're an investor and they're interested in being in the business, then um, uh, they're going to want to see everything because they don't, they're not confident about their ability yet. Um, so you've got to lead them to that. Um, but what he would do is whenever um, he would actually close on the property, he would go in, rip all the flooring out and put commercial tile in. And uh, in that marketplace, he could do that. And that kept it going for um, durability long term because he rented everything Section 8 and uh, people would stay there for years. 
Um, and uh, it's just a little bit different now. Um, Izzy also too, I would be able to say, okay, we're probably going to get a refinance of this, this range right here. So you can't spend any more than this. What can you do for long term on repairs here to make it look fantastic and get pop rent for it in this amount of money? And um, uh, that's normally uh, how I look at properties to share with an investor. And it's on them if they go over that budget. Um, uh, because uh, you can usually do it a couple of times. You can get super close. You can judge those appraisals. You, you know exactly what you're going to end up pulling out of each one of those. Um, and it's so much fun. It really is rewarding and fun, Rob. So I know you have a lot of fun every day doing this. I do. And that's really good advice. And it's something that I kind of had to learn by trial and error about not going to see properties all the time. Um, yes. I have a lot of out of state clients and you know, when I first started, they would ask me to go see a property and I would go see it. And it, it did help me learn the market and learn different areas. Um, but at this point, if they asked me to go see something in center point or Forestdale, I already know, you know, what it looks like. I already pretty right. much know what the house is going to look like and there's no reason to drive all over town. We'll just make an offer, and if we get a contract, um, usually I'll go before the inspector just to make sure it's not falling off the hill or something that they aren't wasting their money on an inspection, but uh, just to get eyes on it, but save a lot of time doing it that way. Well, you really right. do. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gusty. Yeah, I, I got a question as far as uh, do you have any rules of thumb, like when you're looking at a property of like, um, hey, a roof is going to be this amount, uh, painting this house, you know, per square foot, or do you have any kind of rules of thumb that you kind of work with? Yeah, there's some rules of thumb. Um, I would say where we are right now for like a cosmetic rehab, um, per square foot, I would estimate just like, uh, if everything is pretty much in good shape, I'd say just run it at $15, $15 per square foot and then add maybe maybe five or six for a roof and five or six if you need a new HVAC. Um, and that should get you pretty close. You definitely want to have a contractor, you know, during the inspection process, give you some firm numbers. But if you just want a real rule of thumb kind of uh, estimate, that should get you within mm -hmm. range. Nice. That's awesome. We've got two more questions. And um, Zach wants to know, what are some strategies for finding and offering cash for off market properties? So I think uh, there's, there's a lot. Um, there are people that are, that do, uh, do a strategy called wholesaling which is essentially getting properties under contract off market and at a discount, as much of a discount as they can get. And then they resell the contract to um, people who have cash that want to buy and renovate. Um, there's a lot of, you know, buying off market, there's a lot more risks and things that go into it. Um, things that can pop up because you don't have the time to inspect. You don't have the outs that you would have if it was a listed property working with agents. So I don't, I don't recommend that um, to people, especially starting out. Uh, it's something I've done a pretty good bit of though. And really it comes down to networking and going to um, real estate investing groups like REI Live. Um, there's a lot of people who do that strategy there. Um, and you can, and even, you know, when, once you meet these, uh, wholesalers, it really still comes down to building a relationship and, you know, letting them know, here's my numbers. Here's what I can pay for it. Does that work? Um, and sometimes it, it won't work for what they've got. And sometimes it will. Um, but you really have to know, you have to be really sharp on your numbers 
to to buy that way. Well, Gracie, I'm sure you get uh, people calling you all the time saying, I don't want to put it on the market, but, you know, I, I will sell this, this and this. So you probably have a whole list every month of houses that are, you know, what I like to call the secret home for sale. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We, and we get phone calls and, and I know Rob does too. And, um, you know, there's people that are interested in selling and they're just, they're either waiting for the right time or, you know, they're waiting for us to bring somebody. And that's, you know, good to have kind of a list of people that, you know, will buy, um, buy with cash, you know, as an agent, you can just, if you get that kind of call, um, you really should have a couple people, uh, in your phone book that you can say, Hey, this person wants to sell. Um, they'll take, you know, an investor price. What can you give them? Yeah. Um, another All question right. that we have is, um, what are your best sources for refinancing and getting your cash back out of these lower priced homes below traditional 40 to 50,000 range, uh, price homes where regular mortgage companies don't want to touch these loans? So I've done them with uh, some of the local banks, uh, Central State Bank, some of the, the banks that are, I think when I looked at it, it was if they have assets between maybe 400 million and 1.5 billion. Um, that size of bank is going to be more interested in um, making a loan locally they'll look at it at a smaller size. I've done them. Um, they're going to be a lot more interested if you have maybe three plus houses that you can package together, uh, to do a little bigger size loan. Um, and it also spreads the risk out for them a little bit. So it's really, it's tough. I don't have a really great answer for that. Um, and, and it's especially tough out of state. It's uh, to get those smaller loans. It's just almost impossible. I don't have a great resource locally. You know, I think it comes down to just asking around, talking to a lot of lenders. Um, there's people that'll do it. It's just not always super easy. And Brian, um, to answer your question too, there are so many people right now that are um, lending. Um, uh, they're hard money lending right now that they could do 40,000. They could do 50,000 where they couldn't do a hundred or they couldn't do 200,000, but they can do this. So um, uh, I know more and more, I'm meeting more and more people that are um, loaning money from their IRAs for things like this. Um, so uh, I feel like if you can start a network of um, people who will lend themselves because they like to make money just on the interest rates and they don't really want, uh, uh, they just want to hold the mortgage. They don't want to um, have anything to do with the property or collecting rent. Ooh. <laughs> 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 so that's part of their retirement plan. And uh, I think that's probably a really good option for people these days. In fact, um, call Joey Murray because he'll have a couple of people that um, will have use their infinite banks for stuff like this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, I've got a question for you, Rob. What, um, what technology do you use on a daily basis? So um, do, you, do you use CRM? Talk to us about that. Uh, so honestly, I don't have a, I've, started trying to use CRMs and that's something that's definitely a, a goal of mine um, to get better with uh, CRM strategies, staying in touch and kind of working through like a pipeline management um, system because I have gotten in the last year, I've gotten a lot busier uh, and trying to keep everything straight is something I can definitely improve on. Uh, in my business, um, I use MailChimp to, so I have a list of, um, people that buy rental properties, buy flip properties and, uh, and also people that read my blog. So that's kind of from an agent perspective, you know, staying in touch with your database. Um, that's really how I've done it, uh, through, um, email and through uh, social media. So I am on 
social media a lot. Um, I use Bigger Pockets website, which is uh, it's kind of like Facebook for real estate investors. Um, and I've gotten a lot of business from having a presence on Bigger Pockets. Um, and that's a national website, right? It is, yeah. And I mean, it's great for learning any type of uh, real estate investing strategy. There's a lot of agents all over the country on there. Um, I mean, it's it's a great website to check out and to be a part of. All right. What are some of your favorite apps? What Real estate or investing, what are some of the apps that you use on a daily basis? So I definitely... I definitely use like just realtor.com um, looking for like quick comps on properties. Like when someone sends me a property, I'll pull it up there, try to see where it is, what the houses around it are selling for. Um, I use the, honestly, the Jefferson County tax portal and the register of deeds um, to look at sale prices. I look at who bought different properties. Um, I look at, I found uh, private lenders from looking at who made private loans on properties that I saw sell. Uh, so I think it's probably my trading background that I like to use those type of resources to dig into um, who's doing what in the market and kind of building a map of activity. Um, it's yeah. probably, it's helped me a lot in kind of figuring things out in the landscape. Cool. Yeah. And now you have KB core. So there's your CRM. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm actually just getting that up and running. And, uh, and that's, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to make this move to EXP is that, <clears throat> I wanted to be around uh, agents who are more organized, more um, kind of uh, doing things the way people around the country are kind of best practices. So I wanted to be in that environment and pick up um, really the best practices for being an agent um, from that. So I'm excited to uh, really tighten up tighten up my business from that perspective. Well, I'm excited for you. And I know Gusty is, and it opens up the audience for your investment properties as well. A um, couple of things I want to address real quickly um, on what Brian Welch asked a minute ago about financing. Um, be very careful um, because we are looking, uh, you know, there is a downturn that's coming. We don't know when. I mean, it could be another five years. So I don't want to be the, the scare a tactic person um, running up and down saying the sky's falling. That's not it. But when you do investments, you do have to be careful on getting commercial loans um, in a portfolio because they will call them. And uh, many people that I love um, have been hurt by this because the banks in good times will loan and loan and loan and loan and loan and take care of you and love you and give you tickets to stuff and, <laughs> and you know, make it make it seem like you can do uh, anything and that you are invincible. And then when times are bad, they call it and you might not have the money to pay off, you know, uh, 15 rentals that are in one loan. So um, be very careful about that because lots of people. People have lost everything with that. Um, so uh, it's just something to look out for. Fannie Mae will let you refinance what up to 10, mm -hmm. um, up to 10 uh, properties. So that's usually going to be your safest bet. Um, uh, if you're not using in-house bank loans, just be careful about how you structure a lot of that. And uh, yes, Izzy, so glad that you're with us, Rob, she says. And uh, Zach, another question, another answer to your question. Um, and this is just from me hanging out. Rob knows this way better than I do. Um, uh, some off-market strategies. Uh, direct mail is one of the most used ways that wholesalers 
shops um, find uh, off-market deals. Um, it is uh, the pink postcard or the fluorescent yellow postcard. And, you know, I sold one of my rentals that way not too long ago, uh, my last one that I had. And um, uh, direct mail is huge for people finding off-market strategy. So I knew you would like that. <laughs> Hey, one of the things I do want to, to make a point on is at EXP, we are not able to do host selling. So, you know, there's other ways around that. We can charge commissions, um, but we are not actually in the practice of host selling. So I just wanted to make that point real quick. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, how about this? I, uh, well, go ahead, Jenny. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, do you have other questions, Gusty? <laughs> We had a huge announcement uh, at REI Live a couple of weeks ago about y'all's transition to EXP. So, you know, uh, not, uh, you know, I know about it, but not, you know, you've got other viewers on here and and other people that are going to be watching this. You know, why were, why did you and Brian decide to to move the brokerage over to EXP? I'd love to learn about a little bit more about that. Yeah. uh, So, I was in the process of getting my broker's license um, and I was, you know, kind of the plan was to either grow 205 Realty, stay there and grow or potentially start a brokerage. Um, I looked at, you know, every different option that was out there. And um, when I saw it was actually when I saw you move to EXP and I kind of, I had seen it before kind of the business model. And, um, so I, when you made that move, I gave it a second look and, you know, thought about where we were and what we were looking at doing. And, and I realized that really with EXP being what it is and offering what it offers, it just doesn't make sense to try to grow a brokerage. Um, you can sell and essentially the way that EXP is set up um, with some of the agent attraction incentives and with uh, the ownership equity, all that you do own a brokerage and you are growing your brokerage, um, but you're doing it in conjunction with thousands and thousands of other agent broker owners uh, across the country. And uh, so it's just a really powerful model that we both got excited about. And I think it's just, we're excited to be on what we feel like is the front edge of something that's going to be just tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we looked at it, um, or I started looking at it when there was really 2,200 agents. And I'd say looking at it seriously when it was 2,200 agents. And now we're over in just two short years since that, over 23,000 agents. And uh, and I think you made even a post. I think I saw one of your stories that, what, is there like 1,500 agents already that um, have joined in October? Yeah, 1,700 in October. That is crazy. So, um, and this is obviously globally, it's not just Birmingham, but, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a growth that's not only going globally, but I mean, we're growing, you know, I know we've got some viewers in the Birmingham market. We're growing substantially in the Birmingham market. And, you know, there's still a lot of people that I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions that, uh, you know, just haven't reached out yet. We've had a lot of people that have reached out and just trying to learn a little bit more about the model. So, you know, what, so, you know, one thing I do want to ask you is like, all right, you're a couple of weeks in, is there anything that, um, that you thought that, um, you know, heading into it is a little bit different now that you're two weeks in, or is it better than you expected? Just talk to me about that. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I expected some hiccups on the um, paperwork and compliance side because I had, I think I had eight or nine contracts working as I got switched over. And where I'm at right now, I don't have uh, an assistant and um, 
my, you know, all the boxes checked as far as paperwork. Our, our old broker took care of a lot of that for me. So getting it all switched over, um, I knew it was going to be a little bit of a process. Um, but it's actually been a lot easier um, than I thought it would be. Uploading everything into Skyslope, like straight off my phone. Um, being able to just take a screenshot, upload it. Uh, you know, I try to, I'm in my truck right now, and this is basically my office. Right. So I'm always out and about. And being able to do everything off my phone is just a godsend that I can get everyone everything they need and uh, and work it off my phone. It right. is great. All right, let's talk about onboarding. You know, I, I help with onboarding. So, you know, was onboarding easy, tough, just so people that are that are have been thinking about it. Let's talk about your experience of the onboarding piece. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really easy. Uh, we got signs made and um, for all of our agents that came over, we had signs, business cards, um, got all of our MLS switched over, um, had, you know, a clean checklist of what needed to be done. Um, it was, that, that was probably easier than I was expecting. And there's a lot of things yeah. that were on that list that if it wasn't on the list, I wouldn't have thought to do. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and what we're, we're talking about is we've developed, uh, I think it, now it's at 55 points onboarding process. And, and I'm, I love systems and processes. I love to make sure everything is organized and it's definitely more organized than when, when we merged brick into uh, to EXP. So, you know, you just learn over time and there's going to be things that we'll continue to add. But one of the things we wanted to make sure is a smooth transition, a smooth process, because, I mean, we've got people that are coming on board next month. We've got people that are coming on board in January and just trying to have everything organized. So it's a truly seamless process because we just want to sell houses and and we want to be able to not, you know, have any kind of hiccups like day one. All right. We moved your license. The signage has changed out. And you're rocking and rolling. You've got mm -hmm. everything lined up, and you're 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 all uh, speed ahead. So that's one of our main goals for uh, for the transition piece. Right. And uh, I know today I am meeting with a broker who um, is rolling. Uh, I'm going to say their <laughs> company uh, into, even though it's not grammatically correct, <laughs> um, uh, into it and getting all those systems in place have a, another person that is rolling their business uh, two other people rolling their business in today so um, it's uh, we're, we're growing so fast and we're grateful and Rob we're just so happy to have you here and your expertise and I know Brian Tripp is is watching right now so Brian we're so happy to have you and um, you know we have we became fast friends um, because uh, we think a lot alike and uh um, grateful that we all get to be in business together. I mean, Gussie and I are like living the dream because we're like hand selecting. I feel like the best people to work with, like our dream. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm loving it. And, and I, I know uh, me and Jenny talk about every day and then me and Rob are, are now we're getting to the point where we're talking every day. And, uh, and so I've enjoyed just building the relationships um, with everybody at EXP, not only locally, but from a national standpoint, um, you know, the culture I've seen has just been even bigger and better than I thought. So here's one question I do have for you. Um, you know, not everybody knows, but you played uh, football at Duke University. And so, I mean, that is Division One major, major football Super smart university. How have you taken your, um, you know, college football, you know, experience and taken that into the real world or even in the real estate world? Well, so I was an offensive lineman. And as an offensive lineman, you are getting hit like every play. 
So uh, <laughs> it's pretty similar to uh, <laughs> and they're looking for the real estate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. get hit and get back up. You know, you're hitting people and getting hit, and uh, so you you know things don't always go your way in real estate transactions. Things pop out of nowhere and kind of catch you by surprise, and um, so I think that's carries over that you have to be pretty tough um, and you have to be able to kind of roll with the punches on things. That's um, and I think the kind of the team mentality uh, definitely helps that, you know, you learn that you not only do you not need to do it all because it's not what you're good at, but uh, it's a lot better to have other people, doing certain things and um you know kind of like you have your offensive line then you have your receivers very different skill sets and you don't need one doing the other um and that's you know the same in real estate you know as far as uh especially on the investing side like i have learned and i think this has helped me a lot investing and helping clients that i don't I manage a couple properties, but for the most part, I use a property manager. I don't oversee construction. I have a general contractor. Um, I buy and sell houses, and I try to stick to that. All right, Scott. Scott made me laugh. He had a question. How much did you <laughs> squat, Rob? <laughs> I was grinning all that too. <laughs> I think it was maybe four fifty. Was probably the highest. I got. All right. So, Scott, in other words, don't mess with Rob. The dude knows how to take that hit. I was joking. I, I, was, I was joking um, on one of the posts I made about this, um, uh, you know, uh, this uh, this Facebook Live. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm six, two and a half, and, and I don't look up to a lot of folks, but I literally look up to Rob. Uh, <laughs> Rob is a solid six foot six, but he's a gentle giant. Uh, no, it's, it's funny. I, I, I love it. Hey, what's up? Tell me, talk to me a little bit about your morning routine. So I have, uh, we have three babies, three and under. And so. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my morning routine has varied a lot over the last couple years. Uh, and it, a lot of it is trying to help with the kids, trying to get a workout in, eat breakfast, catch up on work. Uh, and it really, you know, I've different times in the last couple of years, I've been fairly consistent waking up early and doing the same thing. But then uh, another baby comes and kind of throws it all, <laughs> <laughs> throws it all out, out of whack and uh, have to adjust and, um, so now, it, you know, it's sometimes like this morning, I got up at five and started trying to knock out things for work. Um, you know, sometimes if everyone sleeps, I might sleep till eight and try to catch up on uh, a couple days worth of sleep. Um, so it's kind of just trying to keep it all together and, and manage. Yeah. All right. What are your goals for 2020? I want to hear them. You're catching me early on that one. <laughs> I know it. Um, so my my goals for I'll start with this year. Uh, I wanted to get my broker's license. Business goals. I wanted to get my yeah. broker's license and close 70 transactions um, for clients and for my own deals. Um. And I will get my broker's license. I'm probably going to be right under 60 on transactions. Um, nice. That's great. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And I, I just find with my, just in my own experience, I usually set a lot of goals and I don't, I don't usually hit exactly what they are, but I usually come kind of close and that's, has worked out pretty well. Um, just sell the five I sent you that bumps you way up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, 
And for next year, I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to aim for 70, try to hit that one. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I really haven't thought that much about what I want to aim for for next year. So that's a, a good question. And this is usually November, December is about when I start trying to write things down about what direction. Right yeah. Okay. So All right. So, so go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say there's a couple, uh, along with the move to EXP, there's a couple other things that I've got in the works and, you know, there will be some goals around that. Um, Sweet. But, that's kind of to be determined. Yeah. All right. So uh, an agent just starting out in the business, um, what would you recommend on, you know, to start building their business? What are some, we have a lot of new agents that watch our, um, watch our lives. So what would you recommend to, to them how to get going in this business? Uh, so I would say just that you've got to find, a way to meet new people, no matter what that is. Um, I took the post license course at the bar and there was a, it was like one page that was in the post license building your business packet. And it talks about um, making money more or less. You don't make money from your sphere, your sphere of influence or your network. You make money from growing your sphere and your network and you know the percentage of people within that that are going to do business with you um and so i know for me when i think back on it it's everything has come from meeting more new people building solid relationships um building trust building competence in what i'm doing over time um and i think if keeping in mind that this business is uh, a longevity play and that your first year, some, obviously some people knock it out of their park, knock it out of the park first year. Um, but some people it takes two, three years before they really get cranking and they end up being some of the top agents around sometimes just from, you know, listening to, uh, really experienced agents who have built great businesses. Sometimes it takes a while. And so that patience and just doing those, whatever it takes to meet more new people, build good relationships and consistently doing that over time will pay off right. and get you where you want to go. Perfect. Perfect. All right, Jen, I think it's about time for us to wrap it up. what do you think? Yes, it is. And I was going to say that um, we're going to be talking about goals a lot more over the next two months. Um, as you may imagine, that Gusty and I are extremely goal oriented. Um, I live for achievement, not competition, but achievement against myself and what I can actually accomplish every year. And so goals are super important. And uh, Clarence is actually teaching business planning on November 14th. It was great last year, but um, we're going to even have more and more um, uh, goal uh, 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 planning sessions and business planning sessions so that we knock out 2020. We got a big goal of 25 by 25. And uh, your 70 transactions are going to be a huge part of that. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, so we, we appreciate you. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Bob, and sharing um, all of this great information. And uh, Gusty, as always, good to see you. Yeah, how can, how can people reach out to Rob? Yeah, uh, really the best way is send me a text or call me, 205-253-8756. Uh, I'm always happy to share, you know, any questions you have or, you know, anything that you want my opinion on, I'm happy to share. So investments, EXP, uh, all of it. And Absolutely. remind us the website for your blog. Uh the blog is www.robdrum.us, and that's it. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a special 
Uh, like every week, we're bringing some fantastic people like Rob today. Next week, we've got a guy by the name of Chad Beasley, and he is the number one agent in the market, Chelsea, Alabama. And so he is going to be sharing how he built up his real estate business and is, and that's, he could probably be the mayor. He probably could be the mayor. What do you think, Jenny? I do know it because I live in Chelsea (laughs) and he dominates and I love it. (laughs) So we're going to learn more about how to take over a city, how to take over a market next week. I hope y'all can attend. Go ahead and log in your calendars and just mark up 930 to 1030 every Thursday. You're going to get good quality information. Thanks so much, Rob, for joining us. And uh, both of you, I hope you have a great day today. Yeah, thank you all for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. See you all. Take care.